Reading with your kids. Hola, ni hao, konnichiwa, assalamu alaikum, shalom, mahaba, moni moni wanji, namaste, jambo, bienvenidos. Hi, my name is Jadley, and this is the Reading with Your Kids podcast. We are coming to you from the beautiful neighborhood of Reedville in the southwest corner of Boston, Massachusetts. We are so delighted that you're joining us in our mission to help families grow closer through reading. Please be sure to subscribe to the show in the iHeartRadio app on Spotify, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Audible, Ghana, Himalaya, wherever you find your podcasts. Our guest today is Ole Bimi Sola Rude Perkovitz, and she is here to celebrate her middle grade novel, Operation Sisterhood. Before we invite our guests into the studio, we want to let you know that this episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is brought to you by another great podcast. It's called the Once Upon an Upset podcast by Jessica Laura Kane. Jessica has been a guest on the podcast a number of times. We love her books. I asked her why she created Once Upon an Upset, and she told me that she wanted to share stories and conversations with kids who might be having difficulty coping with life's challenges, expectations, and disappointments. We all know that it's tough going for kids out there, tough going for adults too. She thought that maybe they felt disconnected or misunderstood, stuck, lost, or afraid. And maybe she thought they communicate differently or think differently or learn differently. She created the podcast for parents who might have a very difficult who might have had a very difficult childhood themselves and are learning to reparent themselves while also parenting their children with the love and empathy they wish they'd grown up with. It's a wonderful podcast. We really suggest that you check it out. Once Upon an Upset, the podcast from our friend Jessica Laurel Kane. It's available on Apple Podcasts. This episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast is also brought to you by the award-winning middle grade historical fiction series, Becoming America's Stories by Antoinette Trulio Martin. Travel back to the Lower East Side of New York in 1911, where millions of immigrants begin their American story. Spunky Lily Taglia and her friends must skirt around old world traditions and face oppression, bigotry, and dangerous streets as history, and perhaps the present, unfold. Check it out today. It's a great look back at history. It's also a great look at what many of our neighbors may be experiencing today. It's the award-winning Becoming America Stories Middle Grade Series by Internet Trulio Martin. Join us right now from the beautiful heart of New York City. Our guest today is here to celebrate her brand new middle grade novel. It's called Operation Sisterhood. Please welcome to the show Ole Bimi Sola Rude Perkovitz. Hey, my friend, how are you? Hi, I'm doing well. I'm excited to be here. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to have you on. We've had uh, we've had a, a blast just chatting about um, getting stiff by different municipalities. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm really ex- I'm really excited to talk about Operation Sisterhood. Tell me about this book, please. Well, Operation Sisterhood is such a book of my heart. It's a middle grade novel about four sisters in a kind of non-traditional, non-typical family in New York City. Uh, They live in a brownstone together with a whole lot of animals, including a very large dog, two very, uh, two cats with a lot of personality, a bearded dragon, some chickens. There's a lot going on in the house. (laughs) It sounds like a lot going on in the house. It reminds me when I was growing up, we grew up in what, people here in Boston know as a three-decker, old wooden frame house, three families, three stories, very small apartments. And uh, my mother, for some reason, being a city girl, decided that she was going to breed St. Bernard's. And I think we had uh, the first litter uh, was like the world record for my dog had 15 puppies and 14 of them survived. And my mom was in great selling, so those 14 cute, adorable little puppies grew into monstrous hearts in a few weeks. Whoa. So I, I can relate to what's going on in the, in the home. 
Yeah. And um, one of the sisters, Bo, who's the main character sort of for this book, she's just coming into this family and into this situation. And she was living just with her mom in a small apartment in the Bronx, very quietly and very happy with that quiet. And so this is sort of a lot for her to take in. Um, One good thing is that she's a musician. She plays the drums and the other sisters are all musicians as well. So they kind of have that bond through music, but there's a little bit of a learning curve for her to Mm. get used to this new situation. Yeah, I imagine so. Every, every family has their own dynamics and, you know, um, and, and hopefully people in, in families learn how to, work with each other and make it flow. But it's always, even in the best of families, it's always difficult being the new person to the scene. Yeah, yeah. And that feeling of newness, I think I write about it a lot because I had that experience a lot as a kid of being the new kid in a lot of different schools and having to sort of navigate a new culture and figure out where I was going to fit in or where I wasn't going to fit in. Interesting. I, can you talk, I want to get back to Operation Sisterhood, but can you talk a little bit about that? I don't think people realize that every school has their own unique culture and that it can be a real challenge for somebody coming into that new situation, especially a kid. Yeah, yeah. And I was a very shy kid also. Um, and in some ways that was helpful because I would be quiet (laughs) and sort of come into a school and just spend time paying attention and noticing and you would sort of see the different cliques and like there were like hierarchies and sort of try to figure it out and books were sort of the thing that helped me even sort of navigate my way through that because you can sort of work things out through stories so I might read a situation in one of the stories and sort of figure out how to apply it at school like okay so this is how they worked out um this kid being mean to them in this story or this is how like this character got the courage to take a risk and try something new um and as a big reader, I would sort of take those ideas and those thoughts from stories and have conversations with the books almost and go out and sort of figure out how to help that help, how to let that help me be in the world of a different school or in a new culture. Yeah. You know, that's something we've talked about a little bit on the podcast, just the, the power that books have to give kids an opportunity to, imagine themselves in ditch different situations and then also to kind of you know one of the things that you know somebody like me who's almost 100 years old you know i have these i have this library of experiences that i can look back on in different situations and so when i'm you know encounter a new situation it's like okay back in 1800 i did this when this happened <laughs> You know, kids don't have that at nine or ten years old. They don't have that wealth of experience. But they can have a wealth of shared experiences through stories. Exactly, exactly. That's why I love book clubs. Um, For a while when my daughter was in elementary school, I would do, um, we call them community builder clubs uh, in the school and with the school library. I was in the library committee. And the students in the clubs were call themselves problem solvers, community problem solvers. And kids would submit little notes or little letters like, this is a problem I'm having with so-and-so, or this is something that's happening right now in the class. I don't know what to do, or I'm upset about this. And the kids in the club would, one, talk about the problem, and we would do little drama and sort of um, SEL activities but we'd also pick books um, that related to the situation that might be helpful that we would recommend uh, for reading and reading together. Wow, what a great club! It was so much fun. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, what was the uh, what was the inspiration for you to write Operation Sisterhood? So I really loved. I think especially with all of that moving that we did and all that new kid experiencing. Um, I loved books that had sort of these big 
happy families. I used to read uh, Elizabeth Enright stories about the Melendi family a lot. I used to read Sydney Taylor's books about all of a kind of family. And Madeline Lengel, um, she often had large families that would kind of sing and play the piano together and just like have these big dinners and it would seem kind of messy and fun. And in some ways I had a big family, but because my parents were both immigrants, my mom was from Jamaica and my dad is from Nigeria and our family was kind of scattered. Um, I didn't have a lot of that kind of like, oh, a million people together um, in the home experience. And I had one little sister who was a great little sister, but I wanted more. And, and so I used to ask my parents every Christmas if they could get us um, more sisters. So like one sister my age and then another sister my <laughs> sister's age so, so that I could have that kind of experience. So kind of all of that sort of has been in my head for a long time. And I wanted a story like that but the ones that I read as a kid did not feature Black families. Mm -hmm. And so I really wanted, and I know Black families like that, and I wanted to just sort of shine the light on that. Yeah, yeah. They are those big families. We don't have a big family. I have two who, kids who are now adult kids, but throughout their childhood growing up, we hosted a lot of international kids and a lot of those kids became family. So when they went off to college here in the States, this would be their home for holidays. Yeah. So oftentimes on Thanksgiving, on Christmas, uh, whatever the holiday would be, we'd have a house full of people and yeah. all these different languages going on. I remember there was one Thanksgiving in particular where we had five languages, five conversation going in five different languages oh, wow. at the table yeah. uh and it was really fun i don't know if i could deal with the 24 7 you know yeah exactly. <laughs> exactly and i think that's how Bo feels in the book like she's like some of this is really cool and really fun and some of this is a lot mm -hmm, mm -hmm, <laughs> mm -hmm. wow one of the things that you said in talking about your own experience was uh, you know Books and, and being quiet allowed you to look at a new school culture and figure out where you'd fit in and figure out where you wouldn't fit in. Yeah. How was that? Did that kind of seeing something and say, no, I ain't going to fit in there. I'm not even going to try. Was that something that uh, was uh, kind of a relief for you to know that, oh, okay, I, I don't have to worry about that? Or was it, oh, man, I... I, I feel terrible about myself. I'm, I can't fit in with those kids. I think it was a little bit of both. And I think there were definitely times where I would, I remember once reading a book called The Popularity Plan um, and trying to make my own plan uh, based on what she did in that book. And it just, it really didn't go well. <laughs> and... <laughs> um, so there were times when I was like, oh, I, I wish I could sort of fit into that culture, that circle. But I think once I realized and found who I did fit in with and the community that I loved and loved me back and that I could feel most myself, that I could make mistakes around, that I didn't have to pretend around um, that really made me realize, okay, why would I want to sort of put myself in a situation where I'm just going to always be uncomfortable mm -hmm. or always be anxious or always, I mean, I'm anxious enough as it is. I don't need to, to, to add to that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I think that that's something that as parents, we can kind of help our kids, you know, realize this. Do, do you really want to hang with those people? Are, are those really going to be great friends? And kind of, because I think a lot of times kids have this, feel this pressure that, oh, I got to get along with everybody. And yeah, you yeah. want to get along with everybody, but you don't have to be best friends or even try to be best friends with everyone. Yeah. And I feel like when I used to talk to my daughter about this, like if everybody likes you, then you're just probably not really being yourself. Because if all of these different people who have all of these different um, ideas and opinions and values all think you're cool, then 
who are you? Like, mm-hmm. you can't, you just can't be everything to everyone. And you certainly can't be joyful or feel comfortable in your own skin because you won't really know who you are. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You were saying that Bo was a musician. She's a yeah. drummer. Yes. Drummers, as a drummer, we're Ooh. different. We kind of think differently. Is that something that, that, that you find in Bo that, yeah, she's a musician, but she kind of looks at the world in a kind of a different way? I think she does. It's funny. I um, I played a lot of different instruments as a kid. And then as a high school senior, I decided for my senior project, I was going to learn to play the drums. Um, and I would go around. I lived just outside of New York City, so I would come into the city and at that time, there were a lot of drummers just out on the street. There were steel pan players. There were like the bucket drummers they still have. And so when I was thinking about Bo, I was thinking about the way she may, she's the kind of kid who might be underestimated, um, who might not be as sort of uh, outgoing as a couple of her sisters, but she thinks really deeply and she almost thinks in rhythm I don't know how to explain it but she thinks about what rhythms in her life make her feel good and what rhythms in her life make her feel comfortable she's also a cook and a a baker she loves to bake and so she's always thinking about combinations and um, things that maybe to other people might not seem to work together but I think because she's a drummer and because she's a baker, she's like, I'm going to, there's something in me that says that this is going to be right. And this is going to be right for me. And it may not work for you, or it may not be what my mom thinks is right for me or what my sisters even think I should do. But I know that this combination is going to work for me. I know that this rhythm is going to work for me. And I think in the story, she has to learn a little about when to really speak up about that and say that maybe I know you mean well, and this might seem like a great thing, and maybe it is, but it might not be for me right now. Mm-hmm. That is such a difficult thing for kids to say sometimes, I think. Very, very difficult. Yeah. Very yeah. difficult. Yeah. I, you know, as you were speaking about being a drummer and kind of looking and experience life, uh, you know, and the rhythms of life, I, I definitely, yeah. um, I definitely feel that that's, that's something that, that's unique. And I think all these different things that you're talking about with Bo in, in Operation Sisterhood, I think of really, Really important and fun conversations we can have with our kids is they're trying to figure out who they are. You know, yeah. uh, you know, if you have a kid who's a drummer and just say, well, so what does that mean? How are you thinking differently? How are you perceiving the world differently than someone who's not a musician, someone who's not yeah. a drummer? If you're a baker, if you're an artist, if you're a writer, yeah. how is that? And is it okay that you're different? And how can you embrace your difference? Yeah, and letting, I think, especially as parents, I know for me, it, it's, well, it's my daughter's a college freshman, and it's still challenging, uh, to give kids room to figure that out means that uh, sometimes I think we're kind of quick to see, like, oh, our child is interested in this thing, so let's go full blast, mm. and um, they're going to take a lot of classes, they're going to, we're going to buy all these resources we're going to do and like almost not give them room to to be in that in that space for a little while um to not feel like they have to excel at everything they try to just to explore and I think that's just so so important and and the way that we can help them figure that out is sort of finding that balance between supporting Um, and encouraging but also giving room and reminding our kids that it's okay to let some things go sometimes like okay maybe you did like that for a while you don't have to keep doing it if if you don't want to Um, you don't have to know what you want to do 
um, it, 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 it's fine to just sort of, to just be. Yeah. Yeah. So important. I remember a conversation I had with one of my son's best friends and when he decided that he wasn't going to play football his senior year of high school after this amazing career and watching him from a little kid with my son, both of them playing football. And he turned to me, he said, I have hated every minute that I am on the football field. I just never let my dad loved it. And he figured that I loved it. So I thought I had to keep going on. Yeah. 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 You mentioned earlier that you were a former literacy coach. Can you just talk a little bit about what a literacy coach is and how you were able to help kids gain that confidence in reading? In reading? Sure. I mean, I was the kind of, like, I feel like I was a bootleg literacy coach. I was, um, I was part of this program through my university. Um, so I started when I was a freshman and it went beyond college. I kept doing it for many, many years um, where we did different things. There was one part of the program very early on where we walked around New York city and knocked on doors and just said like, hi, um, I'm here to talk with your family about food and nutrition and read to your kids if you'd like. And it was like this cold knocking on doors and people were so welcoming and so excited. Um, and so I would go in with my books and talk to the kids and the parents would come and sort of join us with the books. And then we talk about, I, I would usually try to connect a recipe to the story. So we could talk about like, Oh, they made this in the book. Um, here are some simple ways that you could make this in the home. And sometimes the kids would tell other kids in their buildings or in the neighborhood that the reading lady was coming. So I would get to the apartment and there would just be all these kids <laughs> ready to, ready to hear the story. And sometimes I would do many field trips around the neighborhood related like, Oh, um, this, this is when Stevie went to this park in the book. Let's go to the park right here in in your neighborhood and see what that's like. Wow. So I did things like that. And then I did things like writing scripts so that we could, act out uh, the books that we read together. And then later on, I, I really love sort of family literacy efforts. So um, again, like in my daughter's school, we did a, I thought it was such a really wonderful program where we invited parents and caregivers and families to come into the school library in the evening. And we put a bunch of different books around on the tables and I started talking about my own childhood reading experiences and then invited parents to talk about theirs. And we talked about all kinds of reading because I think people read in different ways. So we talked about um, books, film, music, um, fine art, anything. And what really meant a lot to us as kids. And so they were able to sort of share that with the children and the students and then look together to find something that, okay, we, you know, we both really like this, um, like running. Let's look together for a book that maybe has something about running in it that we can read together and talk about together. Yeah, yeah. Wow, such a neat program. It was so much fun. Yeah. I, I, yeah. <laughs> I bet. I did, I, I tutored kids um, in inner city schools in, in Boston throughout high school and college. I didn't go cold calling, knocking on doors. I don't know what that would have been like. It was, yeah, I mean, it was, it was terrifying at first, but <laughs> it was just such, people were so, so welcoming and happy. And there were a lot of families that didn't speak very much English. Um, it was just a really warm experience, which is, I think, a thing that people don't, think of when they think of New York City mm -hmm. um, and I think people don't realize especially because we have so many different people here together and so many different communities within sort of a, a larger tight-knit community there is a lot of warmth and community spirit here in the city and it's really interesting because we come from so many different cultures and backgrounds and so it makes it exciting and fun yeah Yes, living in New York City, living in the Northeast cities are a very different experience. 
Philadelphia, Boston, New York. Yeah. Uh, I think part of it is because it's really cold and yes. you know, here. <laughs> but it's also th- the cities are very diverse and there is a lot of warmth. But there's but you kind of have to get past the loudness and the the rudeness that you may, especially if you're from the south. And, you know, and you come up and it's like, I'm used to people saying, yes, sir, and yes, ma'am, and thank you. And <laughs> people are yelling at me here. I don't understand. Well, they're yelling because they love you. <laughs> <It's> just... Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Even hey. as a kid, I remember one school, I think for seventh grade, there was a school where we had just come from um, Lagos, Nigeria at that point, and b- back to New York. And at my school in Lagos, when an adult came into the room, you stood up and um, you greeted them. And for the first few weeks at the new school back in New York, I kept standing up <laughs> when someone came in the room and my classmates were what like, are what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> hey, I'm wondering, did writing Operation Sisterhood change you at all or change your perspective or give you a new perspective in any ways? Yes, I think, and I think I'm still figuring it out. It's funny, as I talk about the book, which is one thing I love about talking with readers, readers make their own meaning from the story. And so then they say something and I'm like, oh, I never think about, I never thought about that. But I think, I thought a lot about who, what I thought I wanted as a kid and also like what I think about or what I think I want for my child or for other kids when I meet them. And I think about what we talked about, like letting kids be and and listening and learning and not, I think as I was writing, sometimes I was like, oh, I wish I had been like these parents, or I wish I had been more like Mama Hope. And I wish I had done this. I wish I had done that. And I think in the end, I always am going to say, because I think you can always listen, listen more. So I wish I, I wish I had listened more Mm -hmm. and it reminds me to keep listening to my child, to other kids and to really not be too afraid to not have the answer, um, to not be the authority figure, to, to be able to be vulnerable and willing to say, I don't know, um, but maybe we can figure it out together. Or maybe there's a way we can't make this better right now, but I have hope that we can figure out a way to, because I want to learn, because I want to be transformed. And I think Bo in the story does learn and is transformed. And when she sort of talks to her mother about, some of this that you want for me is not necessarily what I want for me. Um, And her mom is able to listen. Like that was definitely one of those parts where I was like, Oh, I wish I was more like her mom. (laughs) Um, That that's a struggle for me because sometimes you want so much for, for kids that, but it's what you want. Mm -hmm. And that it kind of shuts out what they're saying and what, they're thinking about for themselves. Yeah, yeah. So, so, so very important. Well, I know people are going to want to know where they can go to learn more about Operation Sisterhood and find out more about you. Ah, so my website is olubemisolabooks.com and that is O-L-U-G-B-E-M-I-S-O-L-A books, B-O-O-K-S dot com. Awesome. We've had a great time. Speaking to the author of the brand new middle grade novel is called Operation Sisterhood. And our guest has been Ole Bimesola Rude Perkovich. My friend, thank you so much for being with us. Thank you so much. This was a lot of fun. I appreciate it. Please be sure to join us for the next episode of the Reading With Your Kids podcast. Our guest will be Cheryl Tarragon. She'll be here to celebrate. That's ridiculous, said Nicholas. I want to thank the folks who made today's show so wonderful. Chris, I want to thank our guests, Ole Bemisola, Rude Perkovic. Be sure to check out Operation Sisterhood. I also want to thank our sponsors, Once Upon an Upset, the great podcast from our guests and from our friend, Jessica Laurel Kane. 
I also want to thank Antoinette Trulio Martin, her middle grade historical series, the award winning series, Becoming America's Stories, would be a great addition to your family library. Also want to thank my team, Alejandra Doherty, Fatima Khan, Rory Brady. I want to thank my beautiful wife for all the support she gives me. Most of all, we all want to thank you. Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. And as always, thank you so very much for taking the time to make the world a better place by reading with your kids. I'll be looking for you in the next edition of the Reading With Your Kids podcast.